Sydney Casino Festival. We're here uh, with the amazing Vince Power, the man, the legend. <laughs> Very nice to meet you in person Thank and you. to get to chat to you for five minutes. Um, Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, my first question, I'm just going to throw it out there. Uh, it's about your beginnings. I mean, you're a very hardworking man, very driven. And my beginnings was 1947 when I was born. So yeah. I came to London when I was 16. 1963, I think. Got married when I was 18. Had three children by the time I was 20. Wow. Had one before I got married almost. Didn't waste any time. Well, we didn't have TV in those days. <laughs> right. Did you have time? <laughs> um, Starting out then, Vince, was it? I mean, you, you come clear from a hard working family. You're renowned industry wide for being extremely hands-on somebody I mean look at you here you know we've been here for three days and you know it's evident that you like to be there at the forefront at the coal face was it always going to be for you a career like this I mean there's many things that you did in your past but what was it that just grabbed you about the music industry particularly I think it's the only it's the only thing in music I can offer I can't sing obviously I can't play all my kids are, are very creative, they're very, very good at music. I've got five children that are extremely talented and creative, uh, which means I've got to work for at least another 20 years. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm at this side of the music, I love music, and, I, and this is a way of expressing my love for music. And in terms of business, we, we in the in the music industry, we know there's been the highs, the lows, etc. Mm. But you've never stopped. And there's this real drive, and there's also something about your ability to find a gap in the market and almost fill it with something that. Do the public want that? Because your 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 rationale is always about the music. It's about live. It's about the people. It's not about the brands or what they get from it. So, I think I started off like way back in '82 when I. I used to go to Nashville and came back from Nashville and I had I had a successful business in the furniture business, which was great, but it was boring. And it wasn't really, and I, I, it was a big decision I made when I was 13 or something. And I came back from Nashville inspired. I actually got inspired probably by drinking uh, some whiskey in this honky tonk bar. And I got come out of there. I thought this is what I want to do from now on. Drink like, whiskey? No. <laughs> do this bar, this sort of spit and sawdust bar. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened, really. The Mean Fiddlers was, was a spit and sawdust bar with good bands on. Uh, and bands, I mean, I think the only competition I had in London in those days was Dingwalls and the Marquee. Wow. And I got a place that was. A proper PA, proper dressing rooms, showers in the dressing rooms in 1982 were unheard of. And we had a disastrous two years to begin with, which nearly ruined us. And then I got the hang of it. I, it was a hobby for two years because I put everything on that nobody else liked apart from myself. And we changed around and it worked well. And there was an older era then in the 80s, coming up to 85, 86, when, you know. Lots of new music like the Pogues and the men that couldn't hang, all those bands played the Meat Fiddler, you know, uh, Jason the Scorchers. It's so very had, much a spit and sawdust vibe. Yeah, so we all had those bands like uh, Los Lobos and then we went from 86 to amazing success really. The bar just took off, the venue. And for me it was always about as well, it's a talent, I love the talent, but it's always about uh, selling beer. Because you never made money on the door, I always made money selling beer. But once you got them in and had a good time, people used to drink more. So yeah. I always thought, you know, we'd keep one eye on the tail and one on the talent, really. But And that's the way it's worked. It's an interesting thing when, um, when you, it seemed like you were out of the industry for a while or, you know, for someone with such a big profile, but when you came back with Hot Farm, in the, in the world of marketing and brands and sponsors, okay. it seemed like the slap in the face to all of that. And it gave, it gave more credence to the fact that you are about the live, you are about the music, and you are about the audience. That said, 
is it really feasible and achievable to be able to fulfill large scale live events and concerts like this? Is it sustainable so, without brands? I think so. You know, the, 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 the branding and the sponsorship here, which is everywhere, it's a, it's a small part of the turnover, to be honest. You know, it's not. And the Hot Farm never had its ups and downs because of the sponsorship. It had its ups and downs because of the, the present situation with music and the, a bit of the economy. And last year, it was a huge amount about the, the Olympic year where everybody went to see somebody free. Mm -hmm. I, sincerely be, I sincerely believe that uh, we were affected by it. Yeah. You cannot compete against uh, Brandon Flowers playing free. No, definitely so, not. You know, we, but you created a hell of a stir, I mean, if bringing prints to a field, I mean, that's quite phenomenal. I mean, how, uh, yeah. how was something like that achieved? I mean, is that the team around you? Is it's it your only, reputation? Well, it's, it's, is it, it the fact that that event was so alternative? it's my reputation of like, never giving up, but you know, well, really. that's, that's I, a I powerful was, thing in business. I think I was born with the idea of like, uh, you've got to drive forward. I never thought that I had the ability to do, to do a lot in music, but I always thought that if I do something, don't look over my shoulder, keep going, you'll do something else. And when we built up in the, uh, in the early sort of uh, 80s, we started Reading in 89. We didn't start it, but we reinvented it in 89. And then we did uh, clubs like uh, Subterranean was our first club, and then we had the garage, wow. and yeah. then we had the complex, which was a rave place, and then I had the jazz cafe, and uh, the borderline, and the garage, the forum, the Astoria. We even had a place in Luton called Caesar's Palace, which I, I know it. <laughs> I lived in Milton Keynes. I wouldn't like to I talk about it Caesar's a few times. Palace, but we had Caesar's <laughs> Palace. And we, then we had a place in Glasgow called the Tunnel. And, and we did sort of, I did big festivals in America. So we had a real energy in, in the late 80s yeah. and 90s where a real good, real good uh, staff around us, really. Really good people, really good people that wanted to work. And uh, I don't know now when you ask me where do you get the energy because we we ran so much. We had the Phoenix, we had Belling, we had Creamfields, we started with Creamfields. Right. We had Tribal Garden, Homelands, uh, Jazz on a Summer's Day, Madness, Sex Business Reunions, it was. Finsbury Park. And I was saying to a friend of mine last night, the whole thing seemed a bit surreal. You mentioned the, the US and there's something uh, I was reading about which I think is incredibly relevant now and which we were talking about before we switched on the cameras is Nashville. Yes. Your, your desire to bring Nashville sound to London, to the UK. I mean, Nashville is such a hotbed of incredible talent. I mean, Kings of Leon, you know, have four or five different artists, the Weeks, Serpents and Snakes, etc. I mean, are you, are you still immersed in that more contemporary talent that's coming out of Nashville right now. I'm sure we are. You know, I think um, you know. I think I've got my roots are in, in, in country music and Irish music. And you know, if I'm left to my own sort of drunken devices, I will go home and listen to Willie Nelson right. or uh, <coughs> somebody like that. But I think you look at Kings of Leon, you look at a lot of the bands, Arcade Fire. It all comes back to that roots and blues and country. Yeah. And it's just uh, authenticity. Fantastic, really. But uh, that's where I'm at. So all that music is like. Yeah. Uh, what do you see for this Benicassim? I mean, it's, it's it, it seems to be growing. It seems to be getting bigger in terms of the artists. Before. Everyone we've met and spoken to absolutely adores well, the space. I bought it. I actually bought it when I sold it me in Fiddler because I had to sign a non-compete in the UK and Ireland, so I couldn't drop it. But because I'm say I'm so stupid really. I come back straight back into it and I came over here. I knew the brothers that owned this place so I bought this place in 2005 which means I could still operate. Yeah. And the idea of being out of the business for more than uh, I think two weeks I was out of the business for. How does that affect someone like you? This is, off, this is off the mark from the kind of questions I was thinking of asking but somebody who is as driven and a reputation like yours the industry knows about this whole non-compete and what Vince's going to do now. I mean, that's it. You say two weeks you were out of the business and bang, 
you were back in the business. I mean, what what was it, Vince, about that? Was it getting out of the UK but still saying, you know what, I can still do this? Well, you know, it's a, it's a funny thing. I got all the money I could ever imagine when I sold the main fiddler because I never did it for money. I did it, I, in a way, I did it for myself because yeah. I did the stuff I liked and I hoped that people, other people would like it. And that worked. It didn't work all the time, but it worked. And, um, and then when I got the money, the big money, paid everybody, it was probably the loneliest two weeks I ever had. Because I walked out of the office, left the staff, and I had to get back in immediately. And because I knew this place was like uh, one of the festivals. I've been here about three years before that, every year. And I loved it. I loved the sort of idea of uh, the sun. You know, I've been, we did Glastonbury for three years. And I've been to, uh, to festivals with mud and stuff. Yeah. I thought, wouldn't yeah. it be nice to have a festival where you could just like, be more or less 95% guaranteed of weather. So that's what got me back in. And I was happy back in because when you walk out of a company, you take nothing because you, I, my company was a public company then. So when you have a public company, you don't even take your assistant. And thank you so much for the money. But you know, it proved the point that money wasn't, wasn't really everything. For me, money is just a way to enjoy yourself and do what you can do. It's a, there's something to be said for the, the people that will always be there for you. When you lose those people, it does, like you say, it feels like a wilderness, doesn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. But that's, a, mean, that's an amazing emotional attachment to the people that have helped you along your career. Absolutely. I mean, are there still, are those guys, I mean, All we've met I mean, Bev, we love Bev, she's incredible. I mean, are there still Bev's people like rare, that? Bev's a rare find. She uh, is, are there still people like the that? The mean fiddler, like, um, has, had a lot of people in this show. I mean, they're all in very good positions now between the BBC and, and everywhere. The, the mean for had a huge amount of, of talent that went through it, and people went on and became very successful. Uh, we always, I always had a policy of letting people like uh, develop themselves and trying to self motivate them because you can't control. We never, when we had an organization such as big as the mean fiddler in the uh, in the 90s, we had 500 staff. We couldn't, you can't control everybody. So we had, we, you could segment it and, and uh, give responsibilities to people. And it was about, I always, I did very little interviewing with people. I just said, look, you have like three months. Yeah. Nobody's got a body. I don't care what time you come in. I don't care what time you leave it, but I care about how you do the work. Yeah. And this, this worked very well, you know I mean? There were so many people in, who are heads of record companies now who had the Mean Fiddler. The Mean Fiddler was it. Uh, it was a unique period where people had a chance. I, mean, I think that area, has, that area has moved on now because you don't get ENTS managers anymore. You know, you can't, there isn't a, if I put an ad in now for a promoter, like, you get sort of somebody who's, who's been with a failed band. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Made a joke before we started that you're gonna have to keep working to keep the money coming in. When, when will we see Vince switch off, relax? I think that's not gonna happen. I think you'll see that probably at my funeral. Right, <laughs> which is an incredible end. Spike Milligan said, I told you I was ill. Yes. What would it be, Vinny, what would it be that you would say <laughs> keep the party going? What would it be? What would be the epitaph? No, I did. You know, I, I was asked recently about um, how would you like to be remembered, and I, t in an interview, and I said, "Do you assume me? I'm going to die." <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't like to think about it. I would it. like to think I could drop dead on stage with my favorite band. Amazing. Uh, yeah. I don't, you know, it's something you don't think about. You know, yeah. it's not in the plans. Well, Vinny, the uh, the man, the legend, and all the myths that go around. You're a very nice guy, Thank you. and. You know, from someone who's grown up with live music, thank you. And long may it continue. And uh, thanks for spending some time with us at Clash. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Thank it's you. great. Thank you so Please much. Please power up in the Casino Festival. See you later.